Welcome, everybody. <laughs> Lorenzo, thank you for starting us off this morning and for your the stories that you shared and the just really vulnerable glimpse you gave us into your life, your family's life. Um, I imagine that took quite a quite a bit of vulnerability and therefore bravery and courage. So thank you for that. And um, one of the core tenets of our trauma play model is bringing it in the room. Um, we work through a lot of, there's about seven components in our model, including things like enhancing safety and security and soothing the physiology and those sorts of things. But transformative trauma narrative is one of the bedrocks of the model. And the only way to begin to hold a story and then to shape a story is to have it brought into the space in a way that's brave and courageous. And um, it's interesting to me, because I, um, as a play therapist, so I'm a licensed clinical social worker and a registered play therapist supervisor and have been doing this work for probably 25 years. Um, I'm gonna show you in a little bit uh, a video of a young lady who taught me quite a lot when I was first starting out and, and my first several years of work were all in the inner city schools of Nashville, Tennessee, and I saw a lot of the uh, oppressions that um, are just systemic in our nation, the combination of poverty and racism and militarism, all those three violences um, were manifest um, in front of me daily. And I want to start by saying this morning that I recognize my place in all this as an ally to people who have had those experiences. I am not one of the people who have had those experiences. But I think as an ally, um, I was listening to, I think it's Anthony Romero is the executive director of the ACLU, and, um, and, and he was also talking about being an ally and that our core responsibility as an ally uh, is to hold the story, to, to lean in, to lean closer, to put arms around the experiences of others. And um, so I just wanted to esteem you for that, for bringing it in the room because it's, it's, there isn't anywhere else to start uh, except there. So I thought I would, um, just because it helps to structure me a little bit, um, I thought I would share a, a PowerPoint with just a few images and, and thoughts for you guys. Um, and I just wanna make sure, so I'm gonna share my screen now, and I'm gonna move to, and everybody, you guys can see me and hear me okay? Okay, yeah. All right, so I'm going to put this in presentation mode here, so you, and you can kind of see what's coming. Um, so this is Elastigirl, and she is for me the um, kind of beginning point, the 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 symbol that most represents what the the trauma play model is, and what I believe we each are as holders of stories for one another. Um, she, if you haven't seen the Incredibles movie, she's, um, she's pretty amazing. She can stretch her body, uh, her arms out in every direction, and she can get her, the middle of her body caught between doors and still stretch. And, and it is both as a mom and a professional and a holder of um, uh, all kinds of stories for people, something that I strive for all the time is being able to stretch and stretch and stretch. And the way that we conceptualize this idea of holding the story in trauma play is that we are always working on a parallel process level. So whatever it is that I'm trying to offer to contain for the parents in my care, for the clinicians in my care, the experience of that holding is meant to help empower them to be able to hold the stories of the parents in their care and the children in those parents' care. So it's really meant to be a cascade of care that I'll talk a little bit more about. But, but the arms around the fire, the arms around this volcano is really how I experience a lot of what goes on in the play therapy room with complex trauma families, children, teens, adults, and I would say that it is also exactly what we are facing in our nation today. This 
uh, fire. Things are literally on fire and have been on fire in our nation this week. Um, I, and I think that things have been on fire internally for people for much, much, much longer than that. And being able to put arms around the fire to be able to come in closer to it, I think there's a great tendency in humanity to avoid hard things, to shirk away from um, digging into the hard conversations. And I think that it's really what um, play therapists especially train ourselves to do to come in closer in those moments. And, um, and I was thinking, uh, there's another um, quote that I just wanted to share with you guys from just this last week or two, the, um, the CEO of the Center for Policing Equity, Dr. Uh, Philip Goff, um, he was talking about, he's been having, of course, lots of conversations. He tries to um, help with police equity in various states all over the country. And he was talking with um, someone just since um, George Floyd's execution, um, say, who was saying, the pain is like, it's too big to fit in my body right now. And he responded by saying, because the pain is too large to fit into a lifetime. And that's the place that we have to start from, right? If we're going to talk in any way about hope or optimism or shift or change or joy, we have to start by acknowledging the hard things. We have to start by holding the pain and stretching ourselves, whether we are part of the experience, we're allies to the experience, we, are, we have, perhaps have been blinded to the experience. We have to start by stretching our containers because the pain of institutional oppression goes back centuries and centuries. And what we have now learned about intergenerational trauma is that literally our DNA can be shifted over generations of carrying hard things. And so I just wanted to start there today in acknowledging that for people. So what we try to do at the Trauma Play Institute, um, which is in Franklin, Tennessee, and I mean, Lorenzo, to your point, some of the, the things you were talking about are things that I have seen in my local communities um, and um, the, the polarizing presence of fear and anger uh, is one that I think play therapists and the therapeutic community social workers are uniquely positioned to help. But again, it starts by hearing the hurts. And so this, uh, these are a couple of images just of some work I did over in um, Turkey a few years ago. And so these uh, uh, are arguably uh, another um, set of people who have been marginalized in the sense of um, these uh, females in, in that nation and um, over time and in many nations over time. And the question was just, you just simply take a Band-Aid. And I would really encourage you all in, in this time, when you're dealing with your families as they're coming back from the COVID lockdowns, as they're coming back from all of the news coverage of all of the difficult stuff we're carrying as a nation right now, this exercise can be really useful. Um, you can use Band-Aids of any shape, size, color, uh, and simply have them have everyone in your circle whether you're working with an individual child or teen or a parent and child or a whole family system or even in a whole classroom setting um, offering everyone a band-aid and simply asking this question is there anywhere inside or outside of you that has a hurt and needs a band-aid is there anywhere on the inside or outside of you that has a hurt and needs a band-aid and that um, conversation when I have gone um, so some of the work that I did early on was going into people's homes and offering this intervention and the part of the, the reason we don't know the hurt is because we don't ask about the hurt we don't specifically target conversation leaning into conversation about what is the crux of your experience in this way um, and it allows people on a therapeutic level, it allows people to start it, to share at whatever level they want to share. So there are certainly um, some of the kids that I work with who would share, you know, that, that they had a scratch on their hand because they walked past a, a branch and it, it, it gave them a little boo-boo and that may be all that they want to share about. And then I might ask, where would you like the Band-Aid to be placed? And for, for many people, as we just 
have that experience together, even in workshop format, and then we reflect on that experience together, we, um, we have a range of responses to what it felt like, both to be the asker, to have someone ask, is there anywhere on the inside or outside of you that has a hurt? And a range of experiences of being the one asked. And I, I just want to acknowledge that all of those feelings, all of those responses to vulnerability in these ways is to be expected. Is There's room. All of it is welcome in the conversation. And so many people will say it felt kind of awkward to have someone really dig in, come close to me and ask. Um, it felt a little bit intrusive to ask in that way. Um, and I think it's part of what can contribute to us sort of looking the other way when we are in our own discomfort. And so in the trauma model, and I think in the components that apply greatly to the world we're living in right now, part of the work as person of the therapist is recognizing more and more the parts of us that pull away from, pull back from the hard thing, holding the hard story for someone else. Whatever that um, white privilege shame might be for me in having the conversation, whatever the, um, or I think about parents and kids in the playroom all the time, a child will vulnerably share a hurt um, that he, uh, he, she, or they have had, and the parent will minimize it, or the parent will ignore it, or the parent will um, uh, joke about it, um, or the parent will very quickly say, sorry, 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 and that's the end of the conversation. And so much of that has to do with the discomfort that the parent is experiencing inside themselves at hearing that they've been a part of hurting someone that they care for, someone that they're charged with caring for. And so I think part of our work in creating hope and optimism in this next season is looking at ourselves, looking at the places within us that would shy away from the conversations, that would allow discomfort to help us withdraw when we really need to press in. So hearing the hurts. And, and to that end, I'm going to share with you just a, a quick video. This was one of my first um, introductions to the power of play um, and expressive arts in helping to tell stories. And so we have seen in these last couple of weeks um, a broad continuum of how people have tried to express themselves, how people have shared their story, right? From nonviolence to violence and back again, all of these ways of telling are important for us to acknowledge, to understand, and to try to get our heads and our hearts around. So this was a little girl who had been, uh, uh, this was when I was working in the inner city schools in Nashville, and she had spent the night um, in the same clothes she'd been in the day before, which that by itself, you know, was not a big issue. She'd done that lots of times before, but she was also bouncing off the walls, which was a different state of being for her than I was used to seeing from her. And so I took her aside and I very quickly got from her. And this is where we all have to dig in together as a community to really understand how trauma gets stored iconically and somatically in the brain and in the body. She was able to give me very um, easily the top level linguistic, and I would say almost superficial in that way, there's my bias, superficial narrative of her experiences from the night before. And what she explained was that she had um, slept on the front porch in this very dangerous neighborhood. There'd been drive-by shootings in the last couple of weeks before then um, because uh, her mother had gone out to do her second job, um, which was um, uh, making money for the family in an, uh, uh, in an uh, unpaid position um, that had become just in the last couple of weeks before this event, a paid position. So this mom really had no choice um, but to enter in in that way. And this little girl and her sister had not um, had dinner, had not had breakfast, and she came to school from spending the night on her front porch. So do we think that this little girl is going to do well if she just, if I try to bring her into my playroom and just begin to therapize her somehow? Probably not, right? She's going to, there's some things, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, there's some things she really needs first. 
she needs some breakfast, she needs, uh, we put her on a cot in a darkened room for a couple of hours and let her sleep. And only then did we bring her to the playroom. And even then, I don't say, tell me more about the scary thing that happened, but I do offer her all the tools of the playroom, all the ways of telling that are different um, for her, that are available to her extra linguistically. And so um, she went right over to my child guitar and began to strum it. And interestingly, this is what's, and I feel like it's kind of a microcosm of what's happening in our whole community right now. She took the guitar and she went, and she was really trying to regulate her internal state from hyper arousal and chaotic, frenetic energy um, a trauma response to coming back into an optimal arousal state. And I feel like that really is what our nation is doing continually right now as we are moving from hyper to hypo to a state of collapse and back again. And we have not found yet a way to communicate effectively enough with one another in order to move forward. So this little girl first does that regulating work. And then I say, can you put some words to this experience? Can you put some words to this experience? Can you put some words um, to your song? And this is her song. So it hurts inside, it hurts inside, it hurts inside so bad. This phraseology, like these are, there's, there are things stored in her body from the threat that she has been under at least for the last 12 hours or so as she slept on her front porch and arguably for her entire existence. She has been under threat in various ways, ways that I have not personally experienced, but that we cannot ignore and that need to be given voice, need to be allowed a form of expression. And it's part of why I think that play therapy can be so powerful for working with complex trauma. And I would say that if you have grown up as a person who is not a white privileged person in America, then you have experienced complex trauma. You have experienced intergenerational transmission of complex trauma. And that is not to be understated. It is not to be undermined. And it is the job of everyone else to come in and hear and hold the stories. Um, so, so how do we begin to do this, right? How do we begin to hold each other's stories and then move into a place of um, continuing to hold on to, as Lorenzo was saying too, the nuggets of joy? How do we find recognizing that the world is on fire? And before, you know, I was in, um, asked to speak um, for this event weeks ago uh, when the focus of the event was going to be how do we find uh, any place of hope in this COVID time. Um, and even at that time, the answers to me feel very similar in the sense that we need to be able to put arms around it at a macro level. And of course, I'm a social worker. Lots of people on, these, on this call are social workers. And we get trained in the social work field to uh, work systemically, right? And so there's your little uh, micro system and then your, um, your exosystem and the mesosystem is the one in between. And then there's the macro. Anyway, levels and levels of circles of system and I firmly believe that we have to have the stories held at the macro level. There has to be macro level change in order for there to be any movement in any sense of, of racial equality. Um, any, we, have, we, we are entrenched in systems of institutional oppression. And to that end, bottom up or top down in both directions, we need to be holding the hard stories of the people in front of us, um, holding the hard stories. In the meantime, what can we do as we recognize, and, and this is part of where I think joy, and the, the word specifically joy as opposed to happiness, where joy comes from, is when we are um, able to have a deep and abiding hope that things, that our voice can matter, that we will be able to 
affect change, that we can bring our competence, especially for children, we can bring our competence to bear on helping create new understanding, paradigm shift, and actual change. Um, and this quote by Winnie the Pooh is one of my favorites. Sometimes the smallest things take up the most room in your heart. And I really do think that in this time, it, it is the sm especially as we have been all stuck in our homes and maybe and spending maybe glorious time with our families, maybe really hard time with our families, maybe both, that finding the places where we can bring joy in the small things I think is important in this time. And so I'm going to just uh, kind of real quick, I'm going to click through. I just yesterday, just as an exercise for myself, as I was thinking about this morning, I just looked through my photos on my phone from the last couple of months and just some of the tiny things that have brought me joy. And I would encourage you in your own environments that when you have spent time dealing with the really important and necessary coming close, leaning into becoming story keepers for the hard things that are going on in our nation right now. When you have done that, then what can you do to refill your cup? What can you do to become a bigger, stronger container yourself for all that you're holding for other people? And I think that has to do with putting the little joys in front of us again and again and again. And so these are um, some of the ways that I conceptualize how we bring joy. Um, and, and if we want to speak neurobiologically about it, another way that I think about joy is, is in oxytocin, the bonding chemical, and dopamine, the joy chemical. Um, the experiences that we want to give to the brain and body of each and every one of us in this time that there has been such intense trauma. Um, what we know is that trauma creates a, a wash of cortisol stress hormones in our bodies, right? All of us probably have more cortisol stress hormone rushing through our bodies these days right now than you are even aware of. I don't know how it has been for you, but I have felt um, I overwhelmed at times by emotion that I was surprised was even there. We had a... Um, parents and kids, we live on the corner uh, of a street. And so the school buses stop there to pick up the kids for their elementary school. And of course they haven't been in school for months, but they were all gathering. I was on my front porch doing some work and they were all gathering on the street. And I called down and said, what's, what's going on? Um, and, and they said, uh, uh, the school buses are going to come by and the teachers uh, are going to be on the school buses and they're going to, they're going to wave to us. They're going to have a parade for us. Um, and they waited and, you know, sort of like the technology this morning, you wait sometimes for a while to work out the kinks. And I think that the buses had gotten stuck somewhere else. So our, these people were waiting in my front yard for probably an hour and a half. And then as the, and I was just working, working. And as the school buses came around the corner and the, uh, the children, the hope quickened in them. And the teachers uh, had made signs and decorated the school buses and they all um, called to the kids' names and they waved to them. And, um, and I just burst into tears. I had no idea that there was such a deep and desperate need for connection, that there was such a deep and desperate need for um, a meaningful goodbye at the end of the school year for those kids. And then it, and it was such a celebration. It was such a release. Um, the, the moments of joy, we really do have to take them where we can get them. And I think that the biggest place that we get them is in connection with one another, which is why on this play therapist palette here, um, which I created uh, as part of the trauma play model and is in the trauma and play therapy, kind of the second textbook for the model. Um, I was at an art class once and, and I was trying to learn how to hold a palette and I, um, I kept grabbing it in that middle. You see the circle part there that says attachment relationship. I kept grabbing it in there and then dumping the paints on myself. So I was, I was really very colorful by the end of that night. Um, but as I was, as my teacher was helping, she said, you've got to hold all of this really lightly. You've got to just hold it flat with an open palm. And so that is now also the way I think about how we offer joy and invite children and families, especially in play therapy work, into a joyful experience. 
one of the foundational tenets of trauma play is that play, fun, humor, oxytocin, dopamine, um, the competency surges that children have, they mitigate the approach to hard things. And so the more that you all, as parents, as teachers, as caregivers, as therapists, whoever's on uh, this meeting today, if you can feel competent, how do you build your own sense of competency? Uh, and, and how do you bring joy in your own life so that you have it in that cascade of care to pour out on the others who are in your spheres of influence? And so touch is one of the ways that we do that. And if you are not, if you're in a position, I feel so grateful I have my three children in my home with me. It's a gratitude I reflect on every single day. My oldest is eight, is turning 19 today. Happy birthday, Sam. Um, and he will hug me really strong and deep. And that is a great joy to me to get that kind of a intense hug. Um, if you are living alone right now and you can't get that kind of intense hug from someone else, you can actually provide that same kind of input for yourself. Novelty, shared novel experiences, the containment of scary things, being able to hold things for people, using humor, meeting needs on basic levels, um, grounding kinesthetically in kids' bodies, moving in and out of nature, bringing nature into your space and moving into nature yourself, and then using metaphor to help um, give children and teens and adults a more expanded language for how, for their story. Because as we give more vocabulary, as we offer, it's really how I see all of the expressive arts, we are offering extended language to people to share their stories with us. So I'm going to end today by just showing you some of my, just a quick flash of some of the things that have been joys for me lately. This was me and my daughter. She is not able to get a driving permit right now, but she, I think someone's is unmuted. Um, and it's, I can hear you in the background. So if you, if you're just a reminder to mute everybody. Um, so uh, she's 15 and would have gone to the DMV to get her permit, but she can't. So we go to a little parking lot and we just ride in circles. We kind of donut around so she can learn. That was a joy for me just last week. This is a bird's nest that is, I'm waiting for them to hatch. It's sitting on my front porch. It's a joy. This was at a park recently, the ducklings following their mom everywhere and backed up at the back by another safe adult. Um, joy for me. This is my son getting down to feel the moss. Joy for him. A sunset. Beautiful African daisies on the front porch. Coming across gnomes painted by other people on sticks in the woods, knowing that there's a sense of community even out in the depths of nature. A nap in the park. My son graduating from school us taking a ride. This is one of my biggest joys is when we get to ride with the top down and the um, doors off in the Jeep and we're all singing at the top of our lungs and it's pretty ridiculous and out there, but it is a joy for us. And so I'm going to stop the share and just say, let's see, and I'm going to in my video for a minute and just ask you if, and I don't know if it's going to be break time soon, Michelle, in a minute, um, or if you want to give them time to do this now before we break, you can, you can structure me that way. Um, but I'd like for each of us to have an opportunity to do that. I think we, we're spending a lot of time pushing, pushing, pushing to manage all of the balls that we're juggling in our personal lives in our personal as professional lives, in this world at large where we have trauma all around us, it feels like all the time right now. What are those little joys? What are those little things that you can feed and fill yourself with so that you can then hold the hard stories of others and be able to turn those? I was thinking I had a, um, I love when this happens to me. This happens to me frequently where I, I'm typing something on like for a book or a, a chapter or something and I mistype and it adds a letter in somewhere or another. And then I go, oh, it's like a new word. And I feel that way about the, uh, I was writing the word neocortex in a chapter on the brain once and I put a T on the end accidentally and it became neocortex. And I thought, that is what we're after. We're after transforming the core story for people into a new story. And how can we all do that 
together. The same happened um, yesterday when I was just taking some, just thinking through some notes about today and um, holding hard stories. And I accidentally um, wrote heard for an E. I've dropped an E in the hard before. Uh, and then I took it back out and then I went, wait a minute, heard. And I really do think that as we hold hard stories for others, they become heard stories. They can become heart stories where we hear the other, we share it with them. But to be able to do that, our container, we have to have ways, you know, we're, getting, we're being poured into, I see it like a, a, a bucket uh, with a nozzle. So we're being poured into with all this trauma content all the time. And then we have to have a way to siphon it off, right? Or we won't be able to be con containers for the next hard story that we're trying to hold for someone in our care. And so to do that, for me, part of that is taking the moments of joy along the way um, to clean out my container and reset for the next moment. So what I'd like for you guys to do, I'm going to invite you to make your own little, just jot down a little list of maybe, that might have been nine or ten for me, just in little tiny moments in the last few months that are joyful for you. What is it in your own home, in your own front yard, in your own um, but, you know, my husband will open up the bag of coffee grounds in the morning and go and suck in the coffee grounds. And that is, I guarantee you, if I really asked him to reflect on it, he would put that on his list of tiny joys each day. So thank you for letting me be here with you all. Thank you for, um, for the invitation. And uh, I look forward to continuing to be an ally in the work. Thanks. Words are insufficient to express our gratitude. Thank you so much for tying that all so beautifully together and for the emphasis on something concrete that we can do right now um, to help ourselves hold our own stories as well as the hard stories of people around us.